In lecture one, we discussed the overall feedback control structure. And so this was our unity feedback control block diagram. And we offered some sort of uh, roadmap as to where we're going to go throughout this class. Ultimately, we're going to be designing the controller such that the closed loop system response um, behaves in a favorable fashion. So in other words, we're going to get to manipulate the, the system behavior uh, into basically so that it behaves exactly how we want it to. Um, and the point of the first and second lecture were to give you a sort of broad view of what control systems are all about, but before we can close the loop and actually do any meaningful control design, we need to have a very, um, very deep understanding about the system dynamics of the, of the plant itself. So we need to have like a, a thorough understanding of whatever, whatever mechanical, electrical, robotic device that you're trying to control, you need to understand sort of the, the inner workings and the dynamic behavior of that system before you can do control design. And so that's what the first and second lecture were about. Um, so within this broad context of the closed loop transfer function, we have really been just focused on analyzing the plant block for the past two lectures. Okay, and in the first lecture, we were largely focused on, well, how do we take the real life system, whatever it may be, whatever dynamic system you have um, in real life, and how do we capture those system dynamics mathematically? Uh, through the process of modeling, we were able to find that generally, you can derive a differential equation or set of differential equations that govern the motion of that system. Um, and then in the second lecture, uh, lecture number two, we said, well, there's actually a, a second way to describe those system dynamics. So while the differential equations, those are great, they describe the system very well, um, there's often a more convenient method of expressing the same dynamics, um, and that's in the S domain as a transfer function. Okay, So a differential equation, that's in the time domain. Transfer function, that's in the S domain. The point being, again, these are all equivalent um, depictions of the same system dynamics. Okay, uh, The way to get from a differential equation to the transfer function representation is of course through the Laplace transform, which was the theme of the entire uh, lecture uh, number two. Okay, So the previous lecture was all about going back and forth between the time domain and the S domain. Um, but ultimately we are still really just discussing this, um, the plant dynamics itself. We're not doing any control design yet. Um, and it's really important to, to fully understand the dynamic behavior of a system before you close the loop. And so that's why we're spending so much time on it in these first few lectures. Okay, so today we're not talking necessarily about any mathematical tools like the Laplace transform. We're zooming out a little bit and we're discussing system properties. Okay, so it's very important that you understand um, what the properties are, the fundamental properties of these three different um, uh, depictions of the dynamics uh, are. Okay, and what I mean by that is you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of sort of sales to, to, to pitch you on this idea of the transfer function being sort of a standard in uh, control design and analysis, which it is. Um, it's much easier to work with in the S domain. Uh, you have a lot more design tools and analysis tools available once you have the system dynamics expressed as a transfer function. That's a true statement. However, you do need to be aware that there are some limitations to using the transfer function approach. Um, whereas, whereas real, obviously the real life system and even the associated differential equation, um, you know, 99% of all real life systems are to some degree nonlinear. And it turns out that differential equations have no problem expressing nonlinear behavior um, in, in, the, in the time domain. So real life systems are either linear or nonlinear. Um, it also turns out that most real life systems are to some degree time varying. In other words, their dynamics actually change as a function of time. Um, so, so they fall into this category of either uh, time invariant, 
or time varying. And differential equations again have no issue capturing that particular characteristic in the um, dynamic system. However, the transfer function approach, okay, first of all, it cannot capture nonlinear behavior. Right? The, the transfer function itself is a linear function. It cannot express any nonlinear behavior. Uh, it's one of the properties of a transfer function. And transfer functions, for obvious reasons, right? I mean, a transfer function lives in the S domain, um, meaning there's no time argument. In other words, it, it is not capable of accounting for time varying systems. So all transfer functions express time invariant systems. Okay, so all transfer functions are linear and time invariant, and we give that a name that you'll often see in, in textbooks, LTI. So LTI stands for linear time invariant. Um, it's a limitation because, as I mentioned, most real life systems are to some degree a little bit nonlinear, some are a lot nonlinear, and, and some real life systems are time varying um, uh, either a small degree or a very large degree. Okay, so you have to be aware that when you use a transfer function approach, it is a, an approximation of the real life system with these very specific properties. Right, so it's got to be linear and time invariant. Um, it probably makes sense to define what these terms mean so that you have a better understanding of LTI systems. Okay, so linearity, linearity, or whether or not a system is linear. Um, basically in the context of dynamic systems means that we're talking about a linear relationship between the input and the output. And one way to check for linearity is to basically apply the principle of superposition. Um, and what it means, so I'll kind of explain this in two ways. So if you have some transfer function, we'll call that P, and I'm just going to write it down three times. So this is the same transfer function. Um, in one experiment, if we apply the input a times u1 and we record the output a times y1, okay, so this is one input-output um, pair that we get. a is just a scalar constant, u1 is just any arbitrary time uh, function. And then that same scalar constant goes to the output and then we, get, we record some y1 data. Okay, in a totally separate experiment, um, if we apply a different input, we'll call that BU2, and we record the output BY2, okay, the test for linearity is the following. In a, in a third separate experiment, if you were to apply the sum of these first two inputs, in other words, AU1 plus BU2, if you simply apply the sum of those two inputs, if the output happens to be exactly the sum of the two individual outputs, then the system is said to be linear. Right? That's the test for linearity. And it actually, quite surprisingly, in most cases, this is not necessarily the case. Um, due to some nonlinearities in the system, you don't necessarily get that the principle of superposition applies. Okay, so this is sort of the high-level test for linearity. Um, a more graphical way to see this would be the following. So let's let's just suppose you let's just suppose one input looks like this, sort of like a high high frequency sine wave, like so. So this is the U column, and this would be the Y column. So let's say you apply this input, and you get some output that that looks like I don't know, just for graphical illustration of purposes. You apply some sine wave and you get some triangular wave output. Okay, I don't know. Uh, and then in a totally separate experiment you apply this sort of square wave and this gives you the output that looks something reverse of that. Okay? The test for linearity again would be if you were to add these together and basically you would find that the input kind of looks like this If you apply this input and you get exactly the output, which is the sum of the individual outputs like this, right? So that would be a test for linearity, right? In other words, 
does the principle of superposition apply in an input-output sense? Okay, so that's, that's uh, the property of linearity. All transfer functions are linear. Okay, so that's, that's the, the takeaway here. Time invariance is also important. Time invariance means essentially it doesn't matter when you apply a certain input, you're always going to get the same output. Okay? Um, time invariance can be seen. Uh, so, so if I sort of use the same setup as I did for linearity, the way to visualize time invariance is like this. Okay, so let's suppose I apply the input u at time t. So u of t yields the output y of t. Okay, the check for time invariance is that, well, let's suppose I simply delay um, the input by some known delta t. Okay, if the output is the same input but a time shifted version of that, so if the output is essentially y of t plus delta t, then the system is said to be time invariant, meaning it does not matter when you apply the input. It is invariant to time. Okay, so time has no effect on the shape of the output. And in this case, a graphical depiction is often more helpful in my, in my experience. So, so let's suppose at time t equals 0, I decide to apply this input. So there's zero right there. And the output that I record looks something like this. Okay, so there's t equals zero. Um, I apply this input, I collect this output. The system is time invariant if, instead of applying the input at t equals zero, I wait. So there's zero. If I wait some amount of time and then apply the exact same input, we'll call this uh, delta t, right? If I get basically what is just the same shape but a time shifted version of that output, then the system is said to be time invariant. Okay, And um, it may be a little bit trickier to think about this property, but most systems are actually time varying. So if you think about any mechanical systems with moving parts, Think about the uh, friction coefficients between any two moving parts. Depending on the state of uh, their wear, those coefficients will change, which will alter the output. Um, you can also imagine getting into your car with a full tank of gas and going for a long road trip, and the mass of the vehicle has actually changed over the course of that trip. So your dynamics of the vehicle are going to change as well. Uh, if you take that same concept to, say, spacecraft, um, you know, the big rockets that are launching the the payloads out to space, you know, most of the mass on those um, rockets are, are fuel, and, and most of that fuel burns away as a function of time, um, and so there's a huge time varying component to those types of systems. Okay, so again, that's you know the difference between time invariant systems and time varying systems, and again, transfer functions can only describe time invariant systems, so systems that uh, do not change with time. Okay, so it is a slight limitation um, when it comes to um, modeling the system, but you have to weigh that against all of the benefits you get with the analysis and design tools uh, when working in the S domain. Okay, so at this point we have linearity, we've got time invariance. Um, it might be helpful to do a quick check. Um, you ought to be able to look at a differential equation. I'm just sort of making things up here. You could look at some differential equation like this, and you ought to be able to determine whether it's linear or time invariant or both. Okay, so, so this is a pretty typical ordinary differential equation. There's nothing nonlinear about it, um, and there are no... Um, there are no time varying coefficients in it as well. Right? It's a function of time itself, but the coefficients like the scalar constant 2 and the scalar constant 3, those are constant values, so those are not functions of time. So this is a linear and time invariant differential equation. If we look at a different example, y dot plus 
three sine of three sine y is equal to two, for example. Um, this transfer function, I'm sorry, this differential equation contains a trig function, and trig functions themselves are nonlinear. So we can say that this is not a linear differential equation, but again, there are no time variant coefficients, so it is time invariant. This differential equation is linear. There are no nonlinear components to this differential equation, but time appears explicitly in one of the coefficients. So the coefficients themselves are functions of time, which makes this differential equation time varying, uh, and therefore not time invariant. Um, so you, you kind of get the idea. You can look look at your, your different differential equations and identify whether they're linear or time invariant. So along these same lines, let's just look at one final example. y is equal to u dot plus 3u, for example. Okay, so I'll ask you the question, is this linear and time invariant? If you look at it, based on the examples we just did above, it's linear. There's nothing nonlinear about this. There's no nonlinear functions or powers or trig functions, um, and there are no time varying coefficients. So it is it is indeed LTI. Okay, so why do I bring up this example? Well, it's to introduce the third property that I want to cover today, which is causality. Okay, so this is linear and time invariant, but this is what's called a non-causal system. Okay, so when we start looking at differential equations and transfer functions as they describe a real physical system, we have to consider the property of causality as well. And the property of causality essentially says that the current output can only be a function of current or past inputs. Right? There would be no case, in, in our physical world at least, where the current output is somehow dependent on a future input that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um, when I say it like that, it seems totally obvious that yeah, that can't be the case that the current output is due to some future input. However, if you look at this differential equation and you you kind of you scrutinize it a little bit more with the time argument, so we've got y of t is equal to u dot. I'm just going to write du dt plus three u of t, or you look at this, this is the same differential equation, which is linear and time invariant, um, but if we look at what what is actually meant by du dt, think back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is defined as u of t plus delta t minus u of t divided by delta t. Right, so that's the definition of du dt. Right? And, and essentially, you're taking the slope between two uh, adjacent points. Right? That's the definition of the, de the derivative of a function. Because so I've done nothing here except to rewrite the differential equation in a couple of different ways. Um, but we can see here is that if you were to consider this differential equation in terms of a dynamic system where y is the output and u is the input, the problem here is that the current output at time t, well, mathematically, it looks like it depends on some future input u of t plus delta. So no matter how small that delta t is, it is still a greater time stamp than y of t. Okay, And that, that's the problem with this type of system, is that it is linear and time invariant. There's nothing wrong with the ODE itself. It's just that it cannot represent a physical causal system. Um, okay, so, so that's one of the properties. And you can extend the property of causality to basically saying that the, the order of the output derivative, right, in this case y, needs to be equal to or greater than that of the input. Right? The problem with this one is that the order of the input derivative is higher than that of the output. And what you run into is this issue where you need to somehow see one or two steps ahead in order to get the current um, output y of t. Right, so 
So what I mean by that is you could kind of take a look at a couple of examples here. So for example, y double dot plus 2y dot plus 3y is equal to 4u dot plus u. This is, first of all, it's linear and it's time invariant. Um, third, it's causal because the order of the output, the highest derivative order of the output is 2. The highest derivative order of the input is 1. It's the first derivative. And so that is what makes this a causal system. Right? <clears throat> we, can, we can look at a counterexample. If you look at this example, we get y dot plus 2y equals u double dot minus 3u dot plus u, for example. Now you've got a scenario where the highest derivative of the input is now higher than that of the highest derivative of the output. So this becomes non-causal for the same reason that we just described above. Okay, so these are two examples of uh, causal and non-causal differential equations. Now it's important to be able to look at an ODE and identify linearity, time invariance, as well as causality, but you should also be able to identify causality by looking at the transfer function. Right? So the transfer function we already know is a linear and time invariant, but a transfer function could potentially be causal or non-causal. <clears throat> and the way to see it is, okay, if you look at this general description of a ODE, which says it's causal if the highest derivative of the output is greater than or equal to the highest order of the input. Um, if we were to take the Laplace transform of both sides and compute the transfer function from u to y, in this case you get 4s plus 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 3. This is a causal transfer function because it's based on a causal differential equation. If you do the same thing for the non-causal ODE, the transfer function from u to y becomes s squared minus 3s plus 1 over s plus 2. This is a non-causal differential equation. So hopefully what you can see is that as far as looking at a transfer function, you have to look at the order of the polynomial in the numerator and denominator. Okay, so a causal transfer function has a denominator polynomial um, that is that has an order equal or greater than the numerator. So, right, so this is a second order polynomial in the denominator. That's greater than the first order polynomial in the numerator, so that's causal. This case down here, you've got a second order numerator greater than the first order denominator. That's what makes it non-causal. Okay? And yeah, you can have the case where for example, if the orders are the same, first order numerator, first order denominator, that's also acceptable. That's also a causal system. Okay, so you should also be able to look at causality uh, in the S domain just by, by looking at the transfer function itself. Okay. Okay, so we've got linearity, we have time invariance, we have causality. These are three fundamental properties of any um, dynamic system representation, whether it's a differential equation or a transfer function. Um, that's very high level. This is very fundamental stuff that you have to be aware of when dealing with these, these dynamic systems. What we're going to talk about next is maybe one step, one step more specific. Okay, so one step more specific being there's still system properties, but they have more direct application in how we analyze the system. Okay, and that, this concept is the concept of poles and zeros. Poles and zeros of a transfer function. Okay, so once we have a transfer function, we know this linear and time invariant, and we've also identified that it's a causal transfer function, then we, we can actually analyze the poles and zeros of that system. And, and it turns out, um, as we're going to see, the poles and the zeros really essentially dictate how that system will behave. Okay, so for some arbitrary transfer function, generally we can write a transfer function as some 
numerator polynomial in S divided by some denominator polynomial in S. And one way to write that out um, generally is the following. Okay, so some mth order polynomial in S is the numerator, and then some nth order polynomial in S is the denominator. And then, of course, for causality, um, what has to be true is that, is that n must be greater than or equal to m for causality. Right? The order of the denominator polynomial has to be equal to or greater than the numerator. Okay? Now, the poles. Okay, let's start with the zeros. The zeros of a system. So you, which is, the way to say it is the zeros of the transfer function or the zeros of the dynamic system. The zeros are values of s such that the numerator of the polyno, uh, the numerator polynomial is zero. Okay, so they're basically the values of s such that the numerator is equal to zero. So you set the numerator equal to zero and you solve for s all those values of s, those are called the, the system zeros. The poles, it's the same thing except for the denominator. Right? It's the values of s such that the denominator is equal to zero. So if I ask you to solve, you know, tell me what the poles of the transfer function are, you set the denominator equal to zero and you solve for s. Those values of s are called poles. Um, both of these properties zeros and poles have a direct influence well let me let me say it this way the poles have a very direct influence on the behavior of the system and the zeros have a more indirect um, uh, an indirect uh, effect on the behavior of the system so for that reason we'll jump into the poles first um, and analyze sort of what it means when poles are in different locations in the s-plane. Okay, so so from here on out, we're gonna an, we're gonna basically analyze the poles and the zeros of some arbitrary generalized system like this one here. But what we're trying to do is to essentially we'd like to map out the s-plane so that in in a relativistic sense, in other words, if I have one set of poles in one location, and then I look at another set of poles in a totally different location. With respect to the first set of poles, I can see how the system behavior would change as I move those poles around in the S-plane. That's the goal for the next part of the lecture. Okay? Um, this is going to start by looking at something called the impulse response. The impulse response is actually nothing more than a forced response like we looked at in the last lecture. So it's basically the response of a particular system if you apply an impulsive input. Okay? Uh, mathematically, the impulse function, one way to express that is the delta function, which is essentially a very, very sharp and short duration input. Right? So, so the, the delta t for when this input is applied is very small and the amplitude is very large. And the area underneath that curve is equal to one for a unit impulse. This type of input is good for analyzing the system behavior because it's like you're smacking the system with a hammer. You're giving it a lot of initial energy and then you're actually not touching it ever again. So you're, you're interacting with it for a very brief moment just to give it some initial energy and then you're stepping back and you're letting the natural dynamics play out. Okay, So that's the reason we look at the impulse response for analyzing the poles of a particular system. The impulse response itself, okay so if you think back to the forced response, a transfer function is the ratio of the Laplace transform of the output to the Laplace transform of the input, right? The force response computation generally means you solve for the output. 
So the output y of s would be equal to p of s times u of s. And whatever you get for that big y of s, if you take the inverse Laplace of that, you get little y of t, which is the forced response. When u of t happens to be an impulse, well, the Laplace transform of an impulse happens to be equal to 1. Okay, so the Laplace transform, and you can you can look at look this up on your Laplace table. The Laplace transform of the delta function is equal to 1. Okay, and that's that's what u of s is. It's the Laplace transform of, of little u of t. So u of s actually equals 1. Okay, so to actually compute the impulse response of any arbitrary transfer function, you just have to take the Laplace transform of both sides here to get little y of t, and you'll find that you take the inverse, I'm sorry, you take the inverse Laplace of both sides of the equation, the impulse response works out to be mathematically equal to the inverse Laplace of the plant itself, because u of s is just equal to 1. So the impulse response for any transfer function p, you can find just by taking the inverse Laplace of that transfer function itself, which is very nice. If you want to see for some particular system what happens if I smack it with the hammer, you can actually calculate it by just taking the inverse Laplace of that plant. Okay? I'm setting all this up again because the impulse response is very helpful when analyzing um, the natural behavior of a system. Um, and so we're going to connect this to the idea of the poles in the following manner. Let's suppose we have a simple first order transfer function, 1 over s plus sigma. Okay, so first order means the denominator has a polynomial of order 1. This is a first order transfer function, 1 over s plus sigma. The poles, okay, so how do we find the poles of a transfer function again? Remember, you set the denominator equal to 0 and you solve for s. Okay, so the poles of this transfer function, actually there's only one, it's s equals negative sigma, right? Negative sigma is a real value, so in the s plane, right, so the s plane, by the way, is just it's basically just a complex plane, right? The S domain is a two-dimensional domain made up of real and imaginary components. So the S domain is essentially just a complex domain. Um, S equals negative sigma, that's somewhere, that's somewhere here. Right? It's just some value on the negative real axis, right? So minus sigma is there. Okay, the impulse response for this what is the impulse response of a first order system of this form? Well, the impulse response we just determined you can find by taking the inverse Laplace of the plant itself. So little y of t is just the inverse Laplace of 1 over s plus sigma. And looking at my Laplace table, I find that it's e to the minus sigma t. e to the minus sigma t is basically exponential decay as long as sigma is positive, right? So for some sigma greater than zero, we essentially have the following. Okay, we have, we have basically, okay, for a small value of, let's suppose sigma equals one, for, for sigma equals 1, on the s plane, on the s plane we have that there's a pole at negative 1, right? So if sigma equals 1, the pole itself is at negative sigma, and the impulse response is e to the minus sigma t. So e to the minus t. So this is um, sigma equals 1. Okay, it's all connected. The same sigma appears in the transfer function, in the pole location, as well as the impulse response. Now, let's see what happens if we move that pole a little bit to the left. So let's suppose now sigma is equal to 
2. If sigma equals 2, the pole location is negative 2. And if sigma equals 2, the impulse response looks like e to the minus 2t. So e to the minus 2t means oh, we're going to decay a little bit faster. Okay, so there's sigma is equal to 2. If we move the pole further, let's move the pole to negative 3. So sigma now equals 3. The pole is at negative 3, and the impulse response decays even faster. Right? So this would be sigma is equal to 3. So hopefully what you can see is the trend of the rate of decay of a particular impulse response as a function of moving the pole to the left. Okay, so as you move the pole this way, so as the pole moves to the left, you basically get faster decay. <clears throat> and that's what we're seeing here in the plot of the impulse response. So for real poles, for systems with real poles, if you move those poles to the left, the response decays faster. Um, this is one of two axes, right? So the real axes we've discovered for first order systems, if the pole moves to the left, the system impulse response decays faster. Well, the the S domain is a two-dimensional space. Okay, so there's the imaginary component and the real component. Um, if we want to study both, the real and imaginary components, we need to start with the system that has complex poles, right? Not just real poles. We want a system with poles that have a real and imaginary component. Okay, so one way to do that is to look at a second order transfer function. Second order transfer function will have two poles, and those poles can either both be real or they can actually both be complex. So this is a very typical second order system that you might study. The typical mass spring damper system under some in, uh, input function u, or some forcing function u. We can go through and model this system, and we can generate the differential equation of motion. From there, take the Laplace transform of both sides and generate the transfer function from um, the input u to the output displacement x. Okay, so that whole derivation of how you go from this real life system through the ODE to the transfer function. It's very straightforward, but it's in the notes if you wanted to reference that. Okay? Transfer function has the form 1 over ms squared plus cs plus k, where k is the stiffness of the spring, c is the damping coefficient of the damper, and m is the mass of the cart. x is the displacement of that mass, and u is the input force. Okay. This is a second order transfer function because we have a second order polynomial in the denominator. And now what we can do is we can analyze second order behavior. So the poles of this transfer function, well again, the poles you get by setting the denominator zero and solving for s. In this case, because it's a quadratic, we use a quadratic formula to find the poles. So s is equal to minus c plus or minus square root c squared minus 4mk all divided by 2m. Okay, so you're going to get two poles because it's a second order transfer function and based on this form here you can see that depending on c, m, and k you could either have two real valued poles or two complex valued poles. Okay, so basically the poles are real if c squared is greater than 4mk, and the poles are complex if c squared is less than 4mk. Right? It all has to do with the argument inside of the uh, square root sign. Right? Okay, so we can analyze those two scenarios separately. If we let m equals 1, c equal 3, and k equal 2, all we're doing is specifying a mass, a spring damper, and a damping coefficient now. We can just plug into this transfer function. So P of S is equal to 
1 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. Okay, so we plug in some real numbers now, and we can actually reduce this. The denominator is able to be factored, so s plus 1 times s plus 2. That's equivalent, okay? This second order system, if we look at the poles of this transfer function, it's pretty easy to see from this representation that the poles are real. The poles are s equals negative 1 and s equals negative 2. There's two poles and they're both real valued. On the s plane, the poles are here and here. Okay, so you have real poles. You have real valued poles. Let's see what the impulse response of this system looks like. In other words, what is the inverse Laplace of this plant? Okay, well that's pretty easy to do. This is a case where we have, this is a case two scenario. We have distinct real roots, okay, of our S domain function. So let's take the inverse Laplace of that and we'll have to do a quick partial fraction expansion. Right, where this would this would be just a over s plus one plus b over s plus two. Right? So just to refresh your memory a bit, this is how we would set up the partial fraction expansion. Um, this was the entire topic of lecture two. So if you don't remember how to do this, definitely go back and review. And then through the cover-up method, we can easily find the coefficients a and b. And then it's trivial to take the inverse Laplace of both of these guys individually, and we find that the impulse response, which is the inverse Laplace of the plant itself, looks like, a should be minus 1, so it looks like minus e to the minus 2t plus e to the minus t. Okay, this is the actual impulse response. This is the, the time function you would get if you hit this mass spring damper system with the hammer, given these parameters. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, negative e to the minus 2t, that's basically a fast decaying exponential, but negative. And to that, we're adding a slowly decaying exponential that's positive. So what you get when you sum those two together is you actually get something that looks like this. And I keep using y. This should be x, right? The x is the output. That's the displacement, right? The transfer function was from u to x, not y. Okay, so when you sum these two, you get something that looks like this, pretty much. Okay, and this is again the displacement of the cart as you smack it with the hammer. Okay, so what it says is that the cart will be initially displaced, and then because there's a lot of damping in the system, it will just slowly return back to its equilibrium state. Okay, in other words, what you what you observe is that there are no oscillations, right? No oscillations in this impulse response. And so sometimes we call this an overdamped scenario. Overdamped. There's too much damping to allow for any oscillation, right? And the point here is that the fact that we had real poles, this system with real poles corresponds to this Pro, uh, this phenomenon exactly. If your poles are real, the impulse response will never oscillate, right? Um, we'll talk about the difference between overdamped and underdamped uh, a little bit later, but really what we're saying is that the real poles of this second order system uh, align themselves with the fact that there's too much damping in the system and therefore the impulse response will not oscillate. There's, the, the damper is too heavy to allow for any oscillation. Okay, so this was this was for mass equals one, um, damper damping coefficient is c, spring constant equals two. Let's suppose we wanted to see some oscillation, like this mass spring damper system. You can imagine some combination of m, c, and k that when you hit it with the hammer, the mass would actually oscillate until that oscillation finally decays. Um, sort of heuristically what you would expect is if you put in a stiffer spring, you might see some oscillation, or if you reduced the damping coefficient, you might also see some oscillation, right? So let's, let's just do both in the next example. 
So let's now let, we won't change the mass, but what we will do is we'll increase the stiffness of the spring and we'll reduce the damping coefficient a little bit. So what we're trying to do is to induce some oscillation into the system, and we can do that by changing up the variables a little bit. So heavier spring, lighter damper, maybe that'll correspond to some damping. The transfer function now looks like 1 over s squared plus 2s plus 5, uh, which I, all I did was plug into the basic transfer function definition, right? Uh, but this has different poles, right? So the poles here are not real. I can't factor this denominator into a product of two binomials. Okay, so the poles here I would get by applying the quadratic formula, and I find that I get s is equal to minus 1 plus or minus 2j. So we've got complex poles now. So in the s domain, I've got poles here and here at minus 1 plus or minus 2j. And this is a key difference between this uh, configuration and the previous configuration. I've got complex poles. Now complex poles, if the system is lightly damped enough, so if there's, if there's a certain amount of damping in the system that does not exceed a particular level, we will see oscillation in the system. And that's what we're going to try and um, prove here. And we'll prove it by taking the inverse Laplace of the plant so that we can compute the impulse response. Remember, the impulse response, once again, is just you take the plant, take the inverse Laplace of it, and that is exactly how the system will behave if you hit it with an impulse. Okay, so for this system, um, it's a little bit a little bit tricky. I mean, there's nothing that stands out. Like, this is not on the Laplace table, and there's no real partial fraction expansion to be done here. So what do you do in this scenario? Well, just like in, in a, the previous example in Lecture 2, when you have quadratic denominator, often what you want to do is start by completing the square and seeing where that gets you. So take the middle term, divide by 2, square it. In this case, it equals 1. You're going to add and subtract that to the denominator. And what that allows you to do is to rewrite the denominator as s plus 1, the quantity squared. So s squared plus 2s plus 1, that forms a perfect square, s plus 1 squared. And then you've got 5 minus 1 left over, which I'm going to write as, I could write it as 4, but I'd rather write it as 2 squared. And the reason I'm doing that is because there is an element on the Laplace table that looks like omega over s plus sigma, the quantity squared, plus omega squared. So this right here is exactly in the form of something on the Laplace table. Now, I introduced this 2 up here to force it to look like something on the Laplace table, so I have to compensate out in front so that I don't change the, the problem. Okay, So if I rewrite P of S like this, then the inverse Laplace of this, x of t, little x of t, is very straightforward. I just read it off of the table. It's e to the minus t sine of 2t. Just by looking at the Laplace table, this is the Im impulse response. Okay, impulse response. And this impulse response, well, it's an exponential, exponentially decaying function times the sinusoidal function. So this looks like basically an exponentially decaying envelope function and inside of that, you've got this sine wave. It's going to look like that. And then there's a one half that scales the whole thing down a little bit. Okay, But this is the actual displacement of the cart on the mass spring damper system with a heavier spring and a lighter damper. So what we see is that you hit it with the hammer, it will oscillate, and that oscillation will eventually decay to zero. This is exactly what we would expect to happen, only we've now done it in a a very rigorous mathematical um, approach. Okay, so now what we see is we see oscillations. Right, oscillations occur. This is an underdamped system. And it's all connected to the fact that we have complex poles. So we have this imaginary component to the pole now, and that's what's contributing to the uh, sinusoidal nature of the response. Okay.
So we'll do one more, one more thing here before we try and tie it all together. Let's suppose, okay, let's suppose we still have our mass spring damper system, except that we completely unbolt the damper. Okay, so there's now there's no more damping at all. And we'd call this undamped motion. Undamped motion. So we totally, there's no damping, there's no, you know, assuming we put this whole thing in a vacuum, of course, there's no drag to slow down the motion of this cart. So for undamped motion, what you would expect is if you hit this thing with the hammer, it should just oscillate forever, right? There's no um, force trying to, to slow it down. Okay? There's no dissipative force trying to slow it down. Okay, so an undamped force, um, well, remember that the plant has the form of 1 over ms squared plus cs plus k. If there's no damper, that just means that the c term is zero. So what you basically have is just 1 over ms squared plus k. Now, without even applying numbers, like actual concrete values for m and k, you can see something right away. Right? If you, the poles of this transfer function, there's two of them. If you set this denominator to zero and solve for s, you find that you get a pair of purely imaginary poles. Okay, so the poles here are s is equal to, and I'll write it this way, zero plus or minus root k over m j. I put the zero there just to remind you that it's still a complex value, it's just that there's no real component. On the s plane, you get poles on the imaginary axis. That's the key difference here, okay? So you got imaginary poles. And in any system where you have imaginary poles, you would expect, just like this physical example here, you would expect to see pure oscillation. Now, the question is, is that true? Well, if you look at the Laplace table, and you, you massage this a little bit so that you have a leading coefficient of one, Okay, so it's basically s squared, and you, uh, s, let's just do it, okay, so it's, it's, you want a leading coefficient of 1, so you multiply top and bottom by 1 over m, you get s squared plus k over m, but I'd rather write it as root k over m squared, right, and then you need to have the root k over m in the numerator, so we'll pull the 1 over m out front, We'll put the root k over m in the numerator, and then also multiply by the inverse of that, which is m over root m over k, so that we don't change the problem. Okay, so all of this equates to all of this equates to one over root m k times root k over m times s squared plus root k over m squared. If you look at the Laplace table, there's an, uh, an element on the Laplace table that's exactly omega over s squared plus omega squared. Okay, and that, uh, that entry is a sinusoidal um, function. Right? So if this is P of s, then the corresponding inverse of Laplace, which gives me the impulse response, is just 1 over root mk sine of root k over m t. So there's no exponentially decaying envelope function here. It's pure sinusoidal um, response. Okay, so we just get pure sinusoidal response for x of t if we hit this system with a, a, an impulsive input. Okay, so we get pure oscillation. And pure oscillation is directly related to the pole location. So if you have imaginary poles, you're always going to have a system that oscillates indefinitely. Also, if you notice, notice the poles have this term, root k over m. Root k over m, that's the distance up the imaginary axis, all along the imaginary axis. Root k over m also appears here as the frequency of oscillation of that sine wave. So as these poles move, further from the real axis, the frequency of oscillation increases. Okay, so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to get a general sense for 
how the system response changes as we move the poles around in the S-plane. We've already found that as you move the poles to the left, you get a faster response. What we're just finding out now is as you move the poles away from the real axis, you get a higher frequency of oscillation. And so we can actually start to put all this together now. And we can kind of summarize, we can kind of summarize the entire S-plane. Um, so if we put all this information together that we have been working through here, at the real axis here, imaginary axis here. Okay, what we can do is, um, let's start with the, the real poles, the, the system with real poles. So if there's a, a system with one real pole here, we saw that we get exponential decay. What we found is that if we move that pole to the left, we get exponential decay at a higher rate. So the system is going to decay faster. Okay, so this is what we found so far. So as the poles move this way to the left, we get faster decay. What we also found just now is for purely imaginary poles. Okay, so by the way, if I'm drawing, uh, anytime I'm drawing a pole that's not on the real axis, that means it's a complex pair of poles. So in other words, if there's a, if there's a pole here, it also has a conjugate that's down here that I'm not drawing, right? So what I mean is this pair of poles um, gives me pure sinusoidal response, like so. Right? We also just found that as the poles move away from the real axis, so if I slide this pole up and the corresponding other pole down, then I get a higher frequency of oscillation, like so. Right? So as the poles move away from the real axis, I get a higher frequency of oscillation. Okay? Now, it turns out that these two properties are independent of one another, which is nice, because now in the general complex plane, if I have a pair of poles here, and of course there's a complex conjugate, right? Complex poles always come in conjugate pairs. I'm only drawing one of them for reference, okay? So if there's a pair of poles here and here, well this has that property that it's sort of got some exponentially decaying envelope function, which houses a sinusoidal function. And it turns out that, well, along this vertical, along this vertical, the rate of decay is always going to be the same. Whether or not the system oscillates is irrelevant. So if it's a real pole, the response itself is just exponential decay. But if it's a pair of complex poles, you've got an exponentially decaying envelope function which houses this sinusoidal function. The other thing is if you're on this horizontal, the frequency of oscillation is constant. Okay, so in the sense of pure oscillation on the imaginary axis, you have some uh, non-decaying sinusoidal function, but along that same horizontal, if you have a real component, Yes, you will decay, but the oscillation frequency will be the same everywhere on that um, horizontal. Okay, so, so this is a general shape of the impulse response for poles here. Now, these properties, faster decay and higher frequency of oscillation, those apply in the complex field as well. So if we take this pair of poles and we move them over to here, well, in this case, the only thing that changes is the rate of decay. The frequency of oscillation doesn't change, again, along this horizontal. So the rate of decay will be much faster, but the frequency of oscillation inside of that envelope function does not change. Resetting back to this point, if we move vertically, if we move the poles vertically to here, then the only thing that changes is the frequency of oscillation. Right? So the envelope function doesn't change here, but the frequency of oscillation aligns with everything on this horizontal.
like I said, these properties are independent of one another. Of one another. So if we take this pole and move it diagonally, you know, up into the left this way, well, then you get a superposition of those two properties. So in this case, you get the faster rate of decay, and you also get the higher frequency of oscillation. Okay, so that's this is the what I meant by we're going to try and map out the S plane to see what is the effect of the pole location on the system response. Okay, there's one that we left out, and that's the pole at the origin. The pole at the origin is actually an interesting one. It's called an inertial system. Uh, and you could consider the pole at the origin by looking at an object just floating out in space, right? It's purely inertial because there's no springs or there's no damping forces, there's no air, there's nothing but the actual inertia of that block that dictates the behavior of that system. And if we look at, well, if we actually model this system, there's only one force acting on it, and if we look at the output of this, this uh, block being the velocity, our input is the force input, and the output is the resulting velocity. The free body diagram is straightforward. That's all it is. There's no other external forces on this. And then what we do is we apply Newton's law, F equals ma. So the sum of the forces is just u. Uh, mass times acceleration, we're considering the velocity to be the output, so we'll replace it with v dot. And this is actually the differential equation that governs inertial systems. However, if we take it to the next step and take the Laplace transform of both sides, we get that u of s is equal to m s v of s. Remember, the Laplace transform of v dot gives me this s term in there. And then, of course, if we look at the transfer function from u to v, we see that it's just equal to 1 over m times s. And this is a transfer function just like the previous examples that we've looked at. So we can look at the poles of this transfer function. The pole of this transfer function is s equals 0. Right? This system has a pole at the origin. There's only one pole, and there's only one value of s that would make the denominator equal to 0. So this is a pole at the origin, right? which is this last piece of the puzzle here. The pole at the origin, well, what does the impulse response look like? If we call this relationship from u to v, if this is the plant transfer function, the impulse response, little v of t, we get by taking the inverse Laplace of the plant itself. Well, the inverse Laplace of 1 over s is just equal to 1. And so we have a scalar constant 1 over m as the velocity profile uh, when subject to an impulsive input. And that, of course, looks like this. This is just a constant value, right? So the velocity, you know that if you have a block floating in space and you give it a little tap, that block will just go at a constant velocity forever unless some other force acts upon it. Okay, so this is the last piece of the puzzle here. And so if you have a pole at the origin, the impulse response is just a constant value, which kind of, kind of fits into this general scheme. A constant value could be seen as a sine wave of zero frequency, right? Because you're right on the imaginary axis. And because there is no real component, you will get no decay as well. Okay, so there's no decay component, there's no oscillation component, so it's just a constant value. Okay, so this is a map of the S plane, and this is really what I want you to do is to connect this picture to uh, the pole location and realize that the pole location or locations of a transfer function dictate the behavior of that um, of that particular system. Okay. All right. So that's what I wanted to say about poles. The zeros of a transfer function affect the output of the system in the following way: um, the proximity of a zero to a pole governs how much of the effect of that pole is mitigated. So another way to say that is if you put a zero very close to a pole, then the part of the response due to that pole is very much diminished. Okay? So we can we can look at an example of that.
um, here. Right? So again, the zeros have no direct influence on the um, system behavior in the same way that the poles do, but their proximity to poles is how the zeros influence the behavior of a system. So let's look at an example, and this is kind of an extreme case. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Obviously, we could just, you know, mathematically you could cancel s plus 1 in the numerator and denominator, but I'm not going to do that for now. What I'm going to do is say, let's look at this second order transfer function. There's two poles at negative 1 and negative 3, and there's a 0 at negative 1. So the pole 0 map on the s plane looks like this. Pole at negative 1, pole at negative 3, but also there's a 0 right on top of that pole at negative 1. Okay, and so like I was saying, if there's a pole, if there's a zero close to a pole, then the part of that response due to that pole diminishes. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at how we would solve the um, impulse response of this transfer function by taking the inverse Laplace of it. Okay, so we've got a, we got a case with distinct real roots. So we've got a over s plus one plus b over s plus three. Now again, I do realize that we could just cancel that out and that we'd be left with uh, 1 over s plus 3, but I want to do this to, to illustrate a particular um, concept here. Okay, so by the cover-up method, if we start with b, by the cover-up method I would multiply both sides by s plus 3 and then evaluate at negative 3. So multiplying both sides by s plus 3, um, I get b by itself plus a times s plus 3 over s plus 1 is equal to s plus 1 over s plus 1 times s plus 3, but I'm multiplying both sides, so there's also another s plus 3 in the numerator here. Well, all of this just works out to be 1. These all cancel, right? And if I evaluate this at negative 3, s equals negative 3, then this term goes to 0 because there's an s plus 3 term there. So what I'm left with is that b equals 1. Interesting. If I do the same thing for a, right, um, multiply both sides by s plus 1, evaluate at negative 1, I actually find that a works out to be 0. Okay, so, so I get from this partial fraction expansion, which is not very interesting, I get that it's equal to 0 over s plus 1 plus 1 over s plus 3, which I already knew because I saw that I could cancel these s plus 1s. Nonetheless, I'm trying to illustrate that if there are two poles, you're always going to have two components to the response. In this case, because there is a zero directly on top of one of those poles, the effect of that pole is essentially diminished, or, or um, in this case, eliminated entirely. So we can see that the impulse response here, y of t, is equal to simply 1 times e to the minus 3t but I'd rather write it this way just for illustration. I'd rather say that's equal to 0 e to the minus t plus 1 e to the minus 3t. And so basically what I'm saying is you get 0% of the response due to the pole at negative 1, and 100% of the response is due to the pole at, ne at negative 3. This, okay, this seems like a strange way to do it. I recognize that, but if we move this pole just slightly now, or I'm sorry, if we move the zero just slightly, okay, let's move the pole just slightly, so that P of S is equal to, now let's say that it's S plus 1.1 .1 over S plus 1 times S plus 3. Now everything we did up here still applies, because now we can't simply cancel this zero with any one of the poles. So again, we're going to have Again, we're going to have partial fraction expansion, like so. And in this case, because there's this s plus 1.1 here, when we go to apply the cover-up method, we're going to find that a is equal to 0 0.05, and b ends up being equal to 0.95. And that's just doing the same exact mathematics that we did up here, applying the cover-up method to find those coefficients. Now, what we have is a transfer function, p of s, that is 0.05 over s plus 1 plus 0.95 over s plus 3. 
taking the inverse Laplace of this is still trivial. It's, it's just the inverse Laplace of this plus this. And this works out to 0 0.05 e to the minus t plus 0.95 e to the minus 3t. Right, so this is the actual response when we move the zero slightly off of that um, pole. And to kind of illustrate what that looks like, we still have the pole at negative 1, still have the pole at negative 3, but the zero is now very close to the pole, but not quite on top. So we have a zero in very close proximity to the pole at negative 1. Now what I said at the beginning of the, dis the discussion is that a zero in close proximity to a pole essentially mitigates or diminishes the effect of that pole. And so that's what we're seeing here. The part of the response due to the pole at negative 1 is the e to the minus t part. And because of the way that the mathematics worked out, we find that only 5% of the response is due to that pole, whereas 95% of the response is due to the pole at negative 3. Right? 95% of the response is due to e to the minus 3, which, is, which corresponds to the pole at negative 3. Okay, so as you slide this pole, you know, back and forth and, and you know, put it close to some pole or away from another pole, you can, you can kind of dictate which poles are going to have a greater influence on the overall output of the system. Okay, and that's the effect of zeros um, on the system response. Okay, so again, it's an indirect kind of um, response. Uh, it's an indirect effect, but it does dramatically change the behavior of the system. So it does so in an indirect way. Okay. All right. So this is all I, all I really wanted to say about system zeros. Um, I would say the, the really important part from this lecture is to wrap your head around the idea of all the properties of the transfer function, as well as recognize the importance of the pole location as it pertains to the behavior of the system. Okay, the zeros have this indirect effect, but the poles have the primary effect on the behavior of a system. Okay? Um, that's all I want to say for system properties. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to change gears again, and we're going to look into something called the time domain specification as we inch closer to closing the loop and actually um, start to do some control design. Okay, so we'll see you in the next one.